Hi everyone, uh, welcome to DDU Teaching for this week. Uh, I'm going to just do a little bit on tips and tricks for transthoracic echo in the critically ill. Uh, I'm going to use Bob, who's uh, the echo simulator that we've got here. It's quite useful for trying to show a couple of useful little tips and tricks that you know, I think are important to, to look at for the critically ill. Um, I'll just flick through stuff in typical uh, at Echo and PN style. I, I'm just going to wing it and just kind of talk and I'll go through, if, I, I, I'll try and keep it as structured as possible. Uh, I'll start off with maybe a few things on the difficult to image patients. I'll talk a little bit about regional wall motion abnormalities. I'm particularly going to focus on things like off axis imaging and stuff that's maybe not in the textbooks, um, but I find really useful in the critically ill. Uh, talk a little bit about severe valvular regurgitation and how to recognize things like that. Um, what else? Subcostal imaging, you know, the intensivist's best friend, things like that. So I'll just keep talking for about half an hour or so, and I, I hope you find this useful. And um, we'll go from there. Okay, so uh, critically ill patients, obviously, not always the easiest to image. So uh, I can sort of presume that the audience kind of knows a bit about imaging and particularly you're starting off to use Doppler. And all I can say is, as you're, as you're starting to sort of do more advanced stuff, it can be tricky, but you've got to use all the tips to all the things that you can. Uh, and so I guess the first thing to say is that um, if we're looking at Bob here, and I'll just maybe take away um, a bit of uh, a couple of the images, I'm going to take away, hide everything, just have the heart and I'll put the lungs in there. When we're doing our, uh, you know, parasternal imaging, one of the first things that we always te teach people to do is that you've got to be tucked in right next door to that sternum. You know, I sometimes teach people you've actually got to put your ultrasound beam, which you can see here, is actually on the sternum, causing this uh, shadow artifact to appear. You know, sometimes that's that tells you that you're actually right there and almost looking in that sort of twenty cent piece area in that third. Uh, you know, third intercostal space or so to try and get your image, that parasternal long axis image where you've got the aortic valve in the middle of the screen and the LV on the other. And then if you sort of try and sort of, uh, you know, look to one way or the other, you can try and sort of sneak in there uh, in between the, the ribs and in between the lung. If you've got a COPD patient there, you're often not going to be able to get this or if you've got someone who's being mechanically ventilated. And all that's going to try and describe in this in this part here is that if you're not getting the view that you want in this third intercostal space, try moving down the rib space. If you're not getting it, I'll try and view a half decent image. Maybe I'll show you what I'm doing there is I'm just trying to do little bits of rotation, trying to open up this valve area, trying to make this, I do little bits of fanning, try to open up this LV to be as big as possible. And if you're not getting it there, I, again, I can even come further down the rib space. And as it even, I guess you're even coming and imaging people all the way down here, having to, I don't know if I can actually do it well on this one. Even sort of trying to image all the way up, getting images like that. Now, sometimes this is the best that we can get, right? You'll notice as, as I'm imaging down here, almost in this sort of subcostal position, the LV goes more and more and more vertical. And obviously that means that you can't do things like M mode assessment of the LV size because you're going to be massively off axis because you can see I'm sort of in an orthogonal plane, not perpendicular across it. But you don't do those measurements. If you want to do any measurements, you do them just in pure B mode imaging, not with the M mode, because this would, you, you'll see I've got this enormous LV in here that would be about, you know, well over, you know, probably five, six centimeters, which is probably not the absolutely correct. Uh, a correct uh, measurement, but you can still get images. I guess what I'm trying to say is if, you've, if you're up here and you can't see anything, come down a rib space, fan up and down. If you still can't see something, come down a rib space, still can't see something, come down a rib space. And even don't be, don't be frightened of using the subcostal position for your parasternal long axis. Um, nice, all right. Um, I guess, what else should we say about this? Uh, okay. Uh, when you're starting to get B mode imaging, um, trying to get your B mode pictures, you know, sometimes it can be hard to see exactly, you know, the view that you want, something like this. We talk about there being different motions with echo. So we can talk about moving the whole probe up and down. 
we can move going left and right. We can talk about rotating the probe. We can talk about fanning, where you go up and down, like you'd be fanning yourself, or out of plane scanning, because you can see the image changes as I go. Or we can talk about tilting, or I call it fishtailing, which is trying to keep the plane the same, and it's just sort of moving from one side to the other, okay? The movement that they don't describe in the textbooks, and Bob isn't actually great for this, but hopefully if you scan people understand what I mean. It's called, I call it snuggling. <laughs> uh, probably why it's not in the textbooks. Um, the snuggling is this idea that you're almost using like the skin turgor or the soft tissue uh, tension to try and, you see if I'm just on the rib space there, if I can try and pull myself down, I'm trying to pull myself into that rib space. So it's almost like you're keeping the, the probe in the same place on the skin, but just trying to pull yourself down into the intercostal space. And that's doing a couple of things. First of all, it slides you off that rib space so that suddenly the, the picture becomes more uh, apparent. But it also means that you're uh, providing a little bit of pressure that means you're actually sort of um, getting a better contact with the skin. Obviously, you need ultrasound gel, but it's about trying to get a better better contact with the skin so that you can try and get a better view. Okay, so that's the next tip and trick is snuggling. It's sliding off that, uh, that, that rib down into the intercostal space or indeed coming up underneath. That's particularly important, I guess, for the, um, uh, for the apical view. Um, so again, I've got my marker pointing down. Let's try and, uh, I've got the marker pointing down towards the bed. I'll try and find try to find my apical view, okay? And if you see here, see here I'm starting to hit, maybe if I'm down there and I'm on, I'm on that rib in there, see if I can show you. You see the ultrasound beam is on the rib. I'll push myself up, I'll almost right up and over. And I can be a little uncomfortable, so you just gotta be careful you don't, don't hurt anyone too much. Um, but it's about so sliding off that rib space, nestling into the, intercostal space, maybe nestled, a nestled view is better than a snuggly view, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I'm getting into a textbook anytime soon, but it's, it's about just trying to get the best contact you can with the skin to get into the area. Um, okay, let's talk about the subcostal view now. This is one of my faves at the moment. Uh, there's a bit of stuff going around on Twitter about the utility of this, so I'm clearly not the only person who loves this, right? It's, it's, it's super useful. So if I'm in the, I want to put the liver back on, Okay, so intercostal, um, subcostal imaging, we're obviously going to be sitting at the, just below the Ziffy sternum. We're angling our line of interrogation up into the heart. And one of the things that, um, it's, it's probably a bit basic for the audience, obviously we're talking about advanced deco here. One of the most common things that we do when we're doing our subcostal imaging is we aim too anteriorly. And when we're aiming too anteriorly, we can see our aortic valve coming in. If you see the aortic valve, you've got to fan backwards till you lose it. And then the next thing that we do is we often don't rotate enough to make the LV look as long as possible. So the, the movements that I'll do just in summary, once I put the probe on the chest, I start fanning down until I see something flapping around the heart. I continue to fan down until I lose that aortic valve. I then put the echo image and I put the heart into the middle of the screen and then I rotate round. And the same rules apply with basic echo with advanced you do one movement at a time otherwise you can get confused. Beautiful. So that's like a standard view right we do that all the time and then what we know we, uh, the, the normal thing that we do is I then go and try and find the where the IVC starts to come in I put that in the middle of my screen I rotate around it Oops. I rotate around it and I try to find my IVC you know, uh, in that up and down view, cranial causal view, I think would be the correct term. One of the things, so that's all the standard stuff, but what's, what I'm increasingly doing is instead of just focusing on looking at the patient's IVC over on the right here, is actually if we start fanning over towards the left, we can get this view here, the short axis of the heart, Let's decrease the depth of it. And often you can get, pretty good view sometimes. And there are some of the sonographers we got here, particularly Jenny, 
uh, who's one of us notebooks, who's, who can do the entire study pretty much from this subcostal position. She's a phenomenal addict. But here we've got a nice sort of, uh, you know, subcostal view where we've got anterior up here and it'd be inferior down here. Here's the RV, here's the LV, and obviously the lateral and the septal wall. But one of the great parts here is to have a look at this view here so that if we can do a little bit of rotation, there's our aortic valve. Oops, there's aortic valve. But this angle here is really good for trying to get. a view of our pulmonary valve. Because if you then want to try and get Doppler down with continuous rate Doppler, I don't know whether I'll be able to, allowed to do this, but if you're coming down here through our pulmonary valve, you can actually try and get a half decent angle of trying to interrogate our pulmonary valve. In particular, have a look at the, uh, the either pulmonary regurgitation with here and with continuous wave Doppler or with pulsed wave Doppler, you can sit in there and try, and, yeah, it doesn't like me doing this. Maybe it does. Oh, excellent. Uh, and here I'm sitting in my RVOT, and you can actually start trying to interrogate that RVOT va uh, waveform. And I'm looking for a couple of things there, as I've probably talked about in a lot of other uh, lectures, looking for that flying W sign. If that's there, that indicates some significant pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and you can also have a look at your acceleration time. And that's that rate it goes from the base to the peak. Uh, and if that's less than 90, suggesting significant increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So, you know, normally we're looking for those in the parasternal views. Don't forget to do it in your subcostal views as well if you're finding those parasternal views difficult. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in those, anyone with a history of COPD, pulmonary hypertension, OSA, RV dilation, particularly RVs at risk. Uh, I'll do this view quite a lot, trying to figure out if, I'm, uh, if I've got significant pulmonary hypertension or, you know, looking for that RVPA coupling. Nice. Okay, how about we look at a bit of pathology? Um, so, if I look for some, if I look at some regional wall motion abnormalities. So, how about someone with an acute myocardial infarction? Here we go, acute inferior and right ventricle myocardial infarction. Let's try that. Have we got another one? Oh, let's just try. That. Okay, regional wall. Uh, I think regional wall motion abnormalities can be tricky sometimes to try and get your head around. Um, they're the most subjective thing out of echo, and a lot of things in echo are subjective, of course. The tips and tricks I'm going to have is that you have two bites of the cherry at every time you try and assess um, uh, when you're looking at someone's when you're looking at someone's regional wall motion. You got uh, two bites of the cherry, if not three, sometimes if you do the subcostal view. So, for example. Okay, so parasternal view, parasternal long axis view. So what walls are we looking at here? So we've got our anteroceptal and infrolateral. Right, and that means that we can see our base and our mid segments in both of those. That means that when the second bite of the cherry we've got is if we go around to our short axis, so I've just moved from there to there. So in our short axis, again, I'm looking at that segment and that segment, the anteroceptor and the infralateral are the basal segments, because there's the mitral valve, and at the mid, because there are the two pillary muscles. All right? So I get a chance to have a look at those segments twice. The third time I'm gonna be able to look at those segments is if I go to my, if I'm in my apical view. Let's see if I come down, up. Oh, I've chosen a crack. It's, oh, it's got a VSD in there, trying to say. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so if we are in our, so I'm just rotating my probe around. I've got my marker pointed towards the patient's right shoulder. And again, we've got our three chamber view, which is again going to assess our anteroceptor and infralateral. And then if we want a fourth bite at trying to look at any of those, if you haven't seen them in any of those three views, you can do it in your subcostal, particularly in the short axis view looking around. Okay? So, you know, there are multiple views that you can assess those regional wall motion abnormalities. And what you mustn't do is make the call based on one view. And I think it's one of the most common things I see 
uh, when I'm reporting and people have got it wrong, is that they've called regional and warm abnormalities. It's a really common thing to overcall when you're first starting to do echo. And what you've got to try and do is if you think there's an abnormality in one plane, you've got to back it up in another. And if it's regional warm motion abnormalities, look at it in multiple different views. Okay? So with this patient, with our anteroceptal infralateral, those were normal in all those views. So let's talk about what are the other ones. So I guess uh, the other views that we got in our short axis, and this would be my go-to view for regional wall, because you get this really nice ability to just sort of fan through the whole of the ventricle from top to bottom, okay? So we can look at the apical view and I can't see my papillary muscles. I can then come down to my mid uh, papillary muscle view where I can see the uh, uh, posturobenal anterolateral um, papillary muscles. And then I come down to the base where I can see my mitral valve. And you obviously have a look at all of them. And this is the go-to one because I think it's often easiest to do that. If you can't get in your parasternal, don't forget about your subcostal short axis imaging. Okay, and here we can see quite nicely where you've got one part of the heart isn't moving well, whereas another part is. And it's not always as easy as it is to see on Bob. So the standard rule that I'll have when I'm assessing regional wall is you've got to do it in a systematic manner. So after you've used all views possible to assess each segment, and I'm thinking about each segment in turn there. So there are 16 segment model is what I use. You can use 17 if you like, you know, the apical cap. But if you've got 16 segments, you've got to look at each of those segments in every view possible. So for example, as I showed you for the basal in the mid, anteroseptal and infralateral walls, you can do that in the parasternal long, the parasternal short, the apical three chamber and the subcostal. All right, so I'm going to assess each one of those segments in time. And, you, and you've got to be good with this because but you've got to be systematic with it because it's so easy to get it wrong. In the subcostal short or in your parasternal short, I have a very systematic approach to do it. First of all, I almost cover up the screen and I just look at the, maybe I cover up the screen like that. So I'm just looking at those anterior segments. Do they thicken normally or not? Okay, and normal thickening is greater than 50%. Akinesis is less than 50%. Sorry. <laughs> Normal is greater than 50% thickening. Hypokinesis is less than 50. Akinesis is no thickening. Dyskinesis is moving the wrong way during systole. All right, and aneurysmal is not, not really done. So for each of the segments, you've got to try and make that call on what it is, all right? And I say it again, don't try and overreach. Once I've looked at the anterior segments, I'll cover over the anterior segments and just look at the inferior segments. And then I'm going to look at it like a clock face. And I'll even put my cursor right in the middle, and then I'll compare anterior with inferior. I'll compare anteroceptor with infralateral. I'll compare infraceptor with anterolateral. And I do that at the base. Then I do it in the mid papillary muscle level. Anterior to inferior, clearly inferior is not moving at all. That's akinetic compared to the anterior that's thickening more than 50%. Bloody great hole there. Infraceptor not doing anything. So we're looking at it. You know, inferior is this a right coronary territory and in, infarct, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll look at the apex. Okay. So a nice systematic approach. Think about each segment in turn, assess it in every view possible. So that's the tip and trick for regional. Okay. Um, all right, let's do some off-axis imaging. Um, what's good for that, I think? Uh, Let me try thrombus. Have you got interventricular thrombus? Uh, yeah, we go. Left ventricle apical aneurysm with thrombus. Load that up. So, in this next bit, it's all about off axis imaging. Again, it's not often described in the textbooks, because when we're taught, we're taught to get these perfect views. You know, you're taught in your parasternal views, you know, it's like in your third intercostal space, if you can, and it's down, apical view, it's at the apex beat, and it's um, an apex beat looking up, you're on the interventricular septum down the middle, make it look like long and thin, make it look like a rugby ball, not like a football. And absolutely, that's what you should do. But You've got to keep your wits about you because you need to go, uh, some people call it off-piste or off-axis imaging. And I remember Iris Ting, who was the head sonographer here at the Pian Hospital for 
before I got here and she helped build the whole Echo Lab and she was amazing in this and she was the one that taught me. So again, a big, big thanks to, um, to Iris. And what I, what I mean by off axis image and the utility of it is I'm gonna show you, I've done this pathology before so I know this works quite well. So if I'm just gonna do my standard views on this patient and I'm gonna let you know sort of my thought process as I go through it, trying to sort of teach you good habits, okay? So I'll start off with my, uh, this is a patient who, let's call them, they've got shortness of breath, okay, and a history of ischemic heart disease. So I start off my parasternal long axis view, and I think we've got a normal left ventricle size, but we've got at least probably moderately impaired systolic function, okay? So straight away you're thinking uh, kind of the ischemic heart disease, the moderately impaired LV systolic function. You've got to be thinking about things like the region of wall motion abnormalities, like we discussed just now. Um, but you know, there's a cardiac component to the shortness of breath potentially. If I can go around to my short axis view, I start at the uh, level of the aortic valve. I can look down to the base. I may be starting to see that this LAD territory maybe is hypokinetic compared to the other area down there. I just come down a rib space. Okay, now it looks a bit more global in function, globally impaired. And as I come down to the apex, again, just losing that apical, losing that uh, pillory muscle in there. And again, we've got this akinetic area at the apex. So I think that sort of anterior section maybe, and particularly the apex, looks like it's down. So maybe we're thinking about LA territory infarction there. Okay, moderately impaired uh, LV function. There's a cardiogenic component to the shot, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Next thing, let's try and get our decent apical view. Okay, so this is not a bad apical view, right? We've got the interventricle septum down the middle of the screen. Got my right ventricle there, got my left ventricle there. We thought we had LED territory uh, hypokinesis, akinesis. Here we can see on our uh, infraceptal and anterolateral walls, near, uh, the basal segments are contracting normally. That mid segment, particularly here on the infraceptal region, is akinetic, and the entire apex is akinetic. Okay, fits with the apical territory. And again, you can go down to the subcostal thing and do the same thing. But what we got to remember is we've always, if we've got any kind of apical akinesis, you've got to go hunting for clots because with those standard views that I've just got, we missed the massive. So oh, let's just go quickly. Let's, let's take you onto the. Um, I give a game one. Let's go back to our, our view that we had here. So that was our standard four chamber view. But we've got to remember that we are looking at a three dimensional structure with a two dimensional imaging tool. Okay. Echo is a two dimensional imaging tool. You've got a three dimensional structure. And so that means that you've got to fan all the way through it. So just keep fanning up and then keep fanning all the way down through. And what can you see there? Okay, there's a big thrombus most likely sitting there with an apical akinesis, even aneurysmal. And here it's off axis imaging is what's needed for that. And so what I mean by the off axis imaging is, give you that back, is, so if our standard apical view was that, I'll even come up across the rib space and actually angle it almost to a cross section right at the apex, trying to have this view just down of that apex here, all right? Our standard, our standard short axis view is obviously over here. And even if you sort of angle down trying to get in there, you sometimes can't get all the way down. You can just start seeing it in there. And that's where this apical, Apical off-axis view sometimes helps. Then subcostal short-axis view. That's another one that you could potentially use to actually sort of like try and tuck yourself down in there. A little bit tricky. Okay, so off-axis imaging. If you've got apical akinesis, really important. Go looking for thrombus every time. You've got to go looking for thrombus. Uh, the other things I'll do is put uh, color Doppler over that area. Turn down the flows. Maybe turn up the gain so you can try and see some motion if it's in there. Uh, look if there's an apparent space and obviously if you've got access to it, echo contrast is really really good. 
Uh, okay, so that's off-axis imaging with 2D. Okay, off-axis imaging for Doppler. Let's talk a little bit about that. I don't think I've got any pathology, but we can have a look. So we're looking for something with tricuspid regurgitation is probably a good one to start with. Um, and that's someone with pulmonary hypertension. I wonder, I don't think they've got pulmonary hypertension. Let's just try that. Okay, so particularly when you've got any kind of RV dilation or you've got some significant tricuspid regurgitation, you can see some dilation of the right side of chamber. Okay, so start with the apical four. Oops, that's the other probe, the right way around, obviously. Okay, so we'll start with our apical view. Here we go, the right side looks about the same size as the left, so we've probably got moderate RV dilation. And what's, yeah, is it showing me the regurg? Yeah, it's not magic. But often if we've got our standard view, which is something like this, we can have regurgitation that's directed in sort of this direction, as in straight backwards from the tricuspid valve, straight back. And that means that if you've got your, this is not going to work very well. If you've got your Doppler angle, your Doppler angle can be actually orthogonal to where the direction of flow is. And that's why we've got a standard way when we're doing Doppler is you've got to put the color on first to see which way the direction of flow is. And then you've got to go and try and put your, your Doppler angle in line with that flow. And that's again where standard views sometimes are not the best for assessing Doppler flow. So if the tricuspid regurgitation is in a different direction to that, particularly if it's going down sort of more down towards the septum. One of the things I'll do, and if you look over here on this screen and just watch my probe, is I'll slide the whole probe medial, right? And you'll see as I slide it, as I slide the probe medial, let's just get rid of that. As I slide the probe medial, it's no longer the, when I'm lateral, it's the apex and the septum that are right underneath. As I slide medial, what's underneath is the right ventricle. But suddenly I've got a much better angle from a tricuspid regurgitation that was more directed towards the septum. And that's, that tends to be what I find happens is you get the RV dilates, uh, the tricuspid annulus dilates, that you then get uh, essentially some uh, the jets directed more um, posteriorly. Okay, so off-axis imaging for Doppler. And I think the same thing applies for mitral regurgitation. If you're a little bit off-axis, go hunting. Um, all right, maybe a couple of last things on, um, a couple of last things for Doppler. Uh, I might just go to a normal patient for this one. Let's see if this has got better, um, see if this got better Doppler uh, with pulse rate and continuous. So Doppler severity in the critically ill is, I think, a, essentially quite a tricky thing to do. Um, to get good at analysis of valvular function, you've got to spend time in an echo lab, I think, and you've got to be good on sort of normal inpatients and outpatients and you know the easier to image patients before you jump straight into trying to do it in the critically ill. The big thing that we've got to do as critical care physicians is we've got to recognize it when it's a serious abnormality and for that just like in 2D when we're looking for regional wall I say you've got to assess you know all views you've got to gather all the information you can that's particularly important for valvular analysis so you've got to go and gather all the information that's possible and so that means that you've got to assess it with all your Doppler types. So that means you've got to assess it with color Doppler, you've got to assess it with continuous wave Doppler, and you've got to assess it with pulse wave Doppler, all right? And particularly the pulse wave Doppler can be useful for either quantification, using the continuity equation, trying to figure out what effective orifice areas are, effective regurgitation percentages and things like that. But I can find those pretty tricky, I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes in the critically ill, we've got lots of confounders with that, you know, you've got to make sure you've got a decent LVOT measurement, you've got to make sure that you've got perfect uh, uh, Doppler alignment, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I, I think, if you think you've got significant regurgitation in particular, what I talk about is having to look downstream. So and I'll show you what I mean by that. Uh, I might just get rid of Let's just have that, and I'm gonna make it easier for myself. And I'm gonna take away the testing line and stuff. Okay, so 
you can imagine So apical four chamber view, let's pretend that we think we've got significant mitral regurgitation, okay? So if you had a big mitral regurg that was coming down the back down here that you've seen, we can absolutely assess it with color Doppler. You've got to make sure your scale is correct. We can have a look to the size of the jet filling the left atrium, greater than 60% severe. Does it hit the back wall, suggestive of severity? Does it look huge and chaotic? Has it got a coanda effect as it's down the side because that can underestimate the severity of color Doppler? All of those things, great. But one of the signs that you can't really, you know, all of those, sorry, let me say, are, are fraught with danger. So again, a subjective assessment, um, you can get it wrong. And I can make a mild regurg look much more severe if I set my gain wrong or I have the scale too low. Um, and if it's an eccentric jet, I can miss it entirely if it's right the way around the side. So you've got to have your sort of head set straight that if you think there's significant regurgitation, the two tips and tricks I'll give you for mitral regurg are the first of all is assessing this bad boy back here, which is the pulmonary vein, right? So the pulmonary vein, you've got to reduce your depth. So it's right down as narrow as, uh, right down as deep as possible. I'll turn down the scale, if I can remember how I'm doing that. So the color scale, I'll pull that way down to say somewhere maybe like 35. Okay, look at how the, you can see the Doppler getting worse. Uh, leave the baseline where it is. And that means that I'll see low flows, low flow better, because often, and I'm sure anyone whose image knows that you don't look like this all, all the time, but often you just get a suggestion of the color flow sitting here at the back of the LV. And that's where I'm then going to put my pulmonary valve, that's uh, pulmonary valve. My pulsed wave Doppler. All right, and I'll try and put that deep into that pulmonary vein. Uh, Bob is not set up to show you the flows, unfortunately. Um, but you, you'd have a flow. So if you imagine the baseline would be across there, normal flow would be an S wave, then a D wave. So S wave is systolic flow, D wave is diastolic flow, and then a little A wave for atrial kick. So you'd see a whoop, smaller D wave, A wave reversal. If you've got significant mitral regurgitation, you can have systolic flow reversal, as in when the, the ventricle is contracting, massive load of blood is being pushed back into the left atrium, and that's felt in the pulmonary vein by systolic flow reversal, right? That's not, that's not a, uh, you know, if you see it, you've got significant mitral regurg. You can't fake that. All the others you can get wrong with, you know, they've got advantages and disadvantages, but all the others you can get wrong. You can't fake systolic flow reversal. It's a sign of significantly elevated left atrial pressures from significant mitral regurg and typically you know, severe mitral regurg, right? So difficult thing to, uh, to um, forge. Okay, the next one is the inflow. So when you're sitting there, if you think you've got significant regurgitation, I'll try and put color over the LV inflow area. So coming into the LV, I'll look which way the blood's flowing and it looks to me like it's flowing maybe towards that lateral wall a little bit, in which case I'll even sort of tilt my probe around. I'm gonna try and optimize my angle for it, particularly my pulse wave, trying to, get a, trying to get that angle as accurate as I can, which is probably something like that, I would have thought. And then I was going to put my pulse wave Doppler at the tip of the mitral valve leaflets. And obviously my settings are all wrong here. So, so you have your baseline at the bottom. Oh, that's a pain. You get the idea. Put the baseline at the bottom. I should reduce my scale. So what I'm interested is interested in fills the screens. Only three cardiac cycles if you're in sinus rhythm, sometimes look at five if you're in atrial fibrillation. And then if you think you've got significant mitral regurgitation, I particularly look at that E wave if you're in sinus rhythm. And is it greater than 1.2 meters per second? Because if it's greater than 1.2 meters a second, that's indicative of a hell of a lot of blood coming through into that left ventricle. And that can be because you've got a significant amount of regurgitation and then forward flow coming in. 
obviously you've got to make sure you're not in a high cardiac output state. You've got to make sure you don't have any significant stenosis. All right. You've got to make sure you don't have any significant arrhythmias. But another little tip and trick. So significant mitral regurgitation, look at your pulmonary veins, first systolic flow reversal, look at your uh, e wave greater than 1.2, indicating significant uh, elevated forward thrust. How about aortic regurgitation? Do we have any aortic regurgitation? Aortic insufficiency, let's see what this shows. Okay, so aortic valve, we can assess it in lots of different views. We can do our parasternal view looking for the color flow, which is great. You've got our short axis where you can look to see if there's a hole during diastole in the left ventricle. Oh, he's all white. So the albino bob. Uh, let's run on flows. Let's uh, see on flows. Let's just have those things in the heart. I think I'm not going to be able to do exactly what I want here, I'm afraid. Nice. New meeting. Beautiful. Okay, so color, is it going to give us color? Beautiful. So here we've got color Doppler. I mean, we've changed my scale a little bit. So put that color, we're looking more for sort of flows around 60 maybe. And here we can get an idea of, can you see that red that's coming through? Maybe I'll have to turn my gain up a little bit. No, I can't. But you get the idea. Okay, so we can see, oh, then we've got two, the two-dimensional appearance is that we've got some form of deficit there, as in there's a hole at the end uh, uh, during diastole where there shouldn't be. So that's immediately going to think is, oh, we've got significant aortic regurgitation. If you've got an apparent deficit, that's going to be associated with something serious. We've got lots and lots of color flow, maybe not a huge amount we can see on here. Okay, let's have a look at our short axis. You get that apparent defect you can still see there and you can still see color flow on a short axis again maybe this is significant we can look in our apical views okay so there's our full chamber got our color doppler on we fan up and this is where we can get our angle for our continuous wave doppler oh, love it. look at that So I'm not doing a very good job with that, am I? I'm sure there's a faster way of doing this. Perfect. Oh. Okay, so try and get the best Doppler angle color there. I'll try and make sure I'm in the best possible angle there. You can hear, we can see this huge, I don't know, scale up now, I'm sorry. Uh, Color scale, gain, sweep speed, spectral scale, is it that one? Try that. Good lord. Uh, you, hopefully you get the idea. <laughs> and we can have a look at that pulmonary, uh, the pressure half time to give us an indication if it's severe or not. You're looking at 500, 250, our cuts off uh, mild to moderate and severe. And that's great, but it's dependent, on, uh, it's dependent on getting that angle absolutely perfect. It's dependent on getting your Doppler angle absolutely perfect. Um, and you've got to assess it in multiple different views. So as well as that apical four, we can assess it in our, uh, we can assess it with our, I move there, our apical three chamber as well. So don't forget the two things but sometimes it's not that tricky. If you think you've got significant regurgitation, don't forget to go and have a look up at your suprasternal view. So, what is that? Let me just see if I can. I all won't show kind of any standard mode. 
Okay, we'll just scan. Now, so don't forget then you go and look up in the arch. So I often have the pointer pointing towards the, pointing up there towards the shoulder, right shoulder. And yeah, I'm so sorry, you might not let us, oh, let me get rid of the artifact. And actually angling down into the uh, aortic arch. And then just doing a little bit of rotation. Trying to assess the flows in here. Okay. And that means we're not aortic arch, which we can see here. We can start putting our pulse wave Doppler and trying to assess, looking for diastolic flow reversal. Okay. And so if you've got diastolic, particularly hollow diastolic flow reversal, you can look at it here in the arch of the aorta. You can also look at it in the aorta down here. And particularly then you're looking for, particularly in the um, descending aorta, that end diastolic flow greater than 20 centimeters per second flows significant aortic regurgitation. Because obviously the, the aortic valve should close, which means the blood flow shouldn't be going backwards. You've got significant regurgitation. You're even getting flow coming backwards up the aorta back into the left ventricle, okay? That's diastolic flow reversal as well. Um, tricuspid regurgitation, maybe I'll make this the last thing I'll talk about. I'll stop blabbering on. All right, last thing is tricuspid regurgitation. So if you've got severe tricuspid regurgitation, the place to go and look downstream is the hepatic uh, vein. So I might just go back to normal for this one. Okay, so if you've got significant tricuspid regurgitation, you can have massively elevated right atrial pressures. And that means that during systole, when the ventricle is contracting, pushing blood back into the right atrium, that's going to be felt, uh, you know, further downstream uh, in the IVC and in the hepatic veins. Okay, so what we're what we can do then is they are I mean that's kind of giving me IVC the heart obviously, and that's how cerebrum cable is the cardiovascular. Okay, here we can see coming up into there is the IVC and coming off the IVC is one of the hepatic veins. Okay, so that's what we're going to go and try and find. So I'll go subcostally. Find the heart, get this long axis, put it in the middle of the screen. Okay, that's our assess first of all subcostal. Now I'm going to focus on the right atrium. I bring that into the middle of the screen. I start fanning up until I see it entering into fanning up. Excuse me. I'm going to start trying to find that entrance. Trying to find this point here where the IVC enters into the right atrium. Okay. So you see the IVC coming up here, entering into the right atrium. I find that junction. Okay, that junction is in the middle of my screen. I then try to keep everything else the same. I'll rotate it around so that I can see the IVC coming up. And then what I'm looking for is uh, am I going to show this to you? You're trying to find. I don't know if this Bob's not great for this. You're trying to find one of those hepatic veins that comes off. And Bob's not brilliant at this, actually, unfortunately. But you have a hepatic vein that normally comes off about here. Try and get that angle as best you can to be perpendicular. Again, forgive Bob, he's not perfect for this. But trying to find that hepatic vein that comes off here. Again, I'll put color Doppler on it. Ooh, not that one. Color Doppler on it. Low flows. Turn the scale down. So you want a low color scale, maybe close towards 30 and you look for that flow that's sitting in there. Then you're going to use pulsed wave Doppler and you'll put it over here and you're looking for a normal phasic flow. Systolic flow reversal in the hepatic vein, again, associated with significant tricuspid regurgitation 
is what you're looking for as a sign. Can't fake it again, just like the systolic flow reversal in the uh, pulmonary veins with severe MR. You can't fake it on that one either. Um, I think it's probably, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I hope that was useful. Uh, a few little tips and tricks in there. Um, obviously give us a, a holler if you've got any questions, but otherwise I, um, I hope that was useful. Thank you very much for joining us for Advanced Echo Teaching the Critical Care this week. Thanks. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.